Hello students, welcome to EPG Patshala. I am Dr. Hari Prasad, faculty from the Department of Biophysics, All India Institute of Medical Sciences. Today I am going to talk to you about the module Electrophoretic Mobility Shift Assay from the paper Techniques in Molecular Biophysics Part 1. First of all, what are the objectives in this particular module? We would be first discussing about introduction. Then we will have the principles, the critical parameters, methodology which will include preparation of the protein sample, labeling of the nucleic acid, binding reaction, non-denaturing gel electrophoresis and detection by autoradiography. We would also be discussing the advantages and disadvantages of EMSA and alternatives and variants of EMSA. Introduction. Interaction of proteins with DNA is central to the control of many cellular processes, including DNA replication, recombination, repair, the transcription, nucleic acid packaging, the RNA processing, maturation, nuclear transport and finally formation of cellular machinery and viral assembly. MSA is a technique that is used for the detection of the protein nucleic acid interactions. It is rapid, it is very sensitive and a routinely used technique. It is also known as the band shift assay and the gel retardation assay. The principle of EMSA relies on the observation that protein DNA complexes move more slowly than free linear DNA fragments when subjected to non-denaturing polyacrylamide or agarose gel electrophoresis. As we already know, the migration of a DNA molecule during gel electrophoresis varies with the size, smaller molecules migrate faster than the larger ones. On the other hand, if a given DNA molecule has a protein bound to it, the migration of the protein DNA complex gets that much more retarded as compared to the migration of unbound free DNA molecule. Because the rate of DNA migration is shifted or retarded when bound to a protein, the assay is also referred to as gel shift or gel retardation assay. This shift is primarily due to an evident increase in the molecular weight, the adoption of charge and conditional changes in the nucleic acid conformation. The effect of the protein binding on the mobility of DNA is analyzed by polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis followed by autoradiography. The usual characteristic of nucleic acid binding proteins is their competency to sense and manipulate DNA RNA structures. Chromatin remodeling, transcription complex formation, initiation of transcription and translation of messenger RNA to protein all require setup of protein nucleic acid complexes that may consist either of DNA or RNA. Each complex has a different nature and therefore plays a different role in the regulation of protein expression. Binding of protein to nucleic acid is based on the nature of complex and it can either be sequence specific or secondary structure dependent manner. Proteins can interact with nucleic acids in different ways that involve either the major group or the minor group. We have previously studied in module number 21 about agarose gel electrophoresis of DNA. But here we shall try to know something more. When supercoiled DNA is compared to NICT or linear plasmid DNA, during agarose gel electrophoresis, circular DNA migrates faster than linear DNA and same is the true in this case. That is, protein DNA complexes formed on linear DNA fragments result in their characteristic retarded mobility in the gel. However, if a circular DNA is used, the protein DNA complex actually migrate faster than the free DNA. Gel shift assays are just not limited to protein DNA complexes. In fact, you could also study 
protein RNA and protein peptide interactions using the same electrophoretic principle. Even as we are trying to understand about the aspects of electrophoretic mobility shift assay, there are certain critical parameters in this experiment. The selection of the nucleic acid target. So, what is the actual size of the nucleic acid template that we consider in this particular experiment? It could either be short or long. If we have short nucleic acid templates, these things are easily synthesized and inexpensive to purchase. And there are smaller number of non-specific protein binding sites. Also, the binding sites on this particular short fragment are in close proximity and therefore result in aberrant binding. Whereas, for long nucleic acid templates, there are more number of non-specific binding sites and also the migration is that much more slow and also generally give a smaller mobility shift on protein binding. The critical parameters in this particular experiment. First, the binding conditions. Protein nucleic acid interactions are sensitive to mono and divalent salt concentrations and the pH. It is therefore advisable to provide an environment as close as possible to the physiological conditions that would mimic the environment in that particular organism or the human body. So, the buffers that could be used are hippies, mops, bis and tris glycine and phosphate buffers. We also use certain type of additives. These additives are small neutral solutes such as glycerol or sucrose to stabilize the labile proteins. These enhance the stability of the protein and nucleic acid interactions. Here we see a brief outlay of the methodology that is used in electrophoretic mobility shift assay. We have first isolation of the DNA fragments and the protein fragments that would form complexes with these DNA molecules. The free DNA and the bound DNA are then run on the electrophoresis and under native conditions. After the run, these things are now exposed to the X-ray and then developed and the band shift is now observed. We now try to understand the methodology that is used in EMSA. First of all, what are the reagents that are required? We would require ammonium persulfate, temid, acrylamide and NN methyl bisacrylamide. It is important to note that all these reagents should be of molecular biology grade or even better. It may also be noted that acrylamide and bisacrylamide are neurotoxic. Weigh these reagents in a draft free area. We need to wear particle mask, gloves and eye protection when handling acrylamide powders. We should never use a pipette solutions by mouth. Then we try to understand the equipment that is required. We would require a electrophoresis power supply, 250 volts, 200 milliampere capacity is what is recommended and 100 volts and 25 milliampere capacity is the minimum Electrophoresis apparatus, this equipment includes glass plates, spacers, well forming combs, clamps and optionally a gel casting stand is needed to prepare and run the polyacrylamide gel. Autoradiography film cassette and a Kodak XAR5 film or a cassette and storage phosphor screen. Access to a dark room would also be required to develop the film in the film autoradiography. Access to a phosphor imager instrument is needed for storage of phosphor screen autoradiography. Accurately calibrated air displacement 
pipettes would be required to remove bubbles. Next, the procedure. Clean all the gel plates, spacers and comb. Remove any fingerprints or other residue from the glass plates with 70% ethanol. Ensure that all components are dry before starting the experiment. Prepare the polymerization mixture and fill the glass plate assembly with this particular mixture. Avoid bubble formation. Insert a well forming comb immediately and allow the gel to polymerize for at least 2 hours. Care must be taken about bubble formation during gel casting. Since bubbles do not conduct electrical current, they interfere with the electrophoretic movement. I provide some of the important tips to avoid bubble formation. Pour the polymerization mixture very slowly. Slant the assemble 45 degrees during the pouring. And if bubbles are still trapped, then carefully tap the assembly with a spatula to remove the bubbles. The procedure for the acrylamide formation and the casting of the gel is same as that is described in SDS page. For several hours, the gels can be stored at room temperature with open edges sealed with a plastic film. For up to one week, the gels can be stored at 4 degrees centigrade and 100% humidity. Put the gel in a plastic box to maintain the humidity. A paper wick can be used which is attached to the side of the box and saturated with water from the other side. Remove the comb from the mold. Wash the well with distilled water and mount the gel in the vertical electrophoresis apparatus. Add electrophoretic buffer to the top and bottom reservoir of the apparatus. Load the samples which include the free DNA and the bound DNA onto the gel. Attach the apparatus to the power supply unit and apply a voltage of 120 to 180 volts. Electrophoresis is continued until bromophenol blue reaches the bottom of the gel. At the end of the electrophoresis, dismantle the apparatus and place the plates in a tray and dry it thoroughly with paper towels. Carefully separate the plates, leaving the gel stick to one of the plates. Enfold the gel and plate in a plastic food wrap. It is important to note that before separating the gel and plate assembly, it must be dried because of the following reasons. The remaining buffer trapped between the plates can cause vacuum formation. This can distort the gel during separation of the gel from the plates. Presence of free buffer on the gel surface can lead to elution of radioactive nucleic acid from the gel. This Free radioisotope can be troublesome in autoradiography detection and potentially safety hazard. Then we talk about the detection which is seen on the right side. Detection methods will depend on the nature of the label used during synthesis and labeling of the nucleic acid. A radioisotope Phosphorus-32 is commonly used to detect nucleic acids, but it's a hazardous material to work with. The other options such as biotin or digoxygenin could be used as non-radioactive labels. These, however, are less sensitive and detection procedure can involve extra steps such as transfer to a membrane and incubation with primary and secondary antibodies as well as intermediate washing steps. Now we talk about autoradiography. The use of autoradiography with gels requires the gel to be dried prior to being placed. 
stepwise. Take the gel with the plate and dip it in 7% acetic acid for 5 minutes. Wash the gel with distilled water and remove extra fluid from gel surface with Kim swipes only. Enfold the gel and supporting plate in a food wrap made of polyethylene. This will prevent the gel from sticking to the film and contaminating the cassette. The wrapped surface of the gel should be free of air bubbles and wrinkles, otherwise it will interfere with autoradiography. Also, make sure that the gel is completely dried. Place the wrapped gel and plate assembly in a cassette with the gel side towards the film or the screen. Expose the film for appropriate period of time at room temperature or at 20 degrees Celsius. Develop fix and dry the X-ray film as recommended by the manufacturer. So in order, the cassette would include a film cassette, intensifying screen, film, the sample and again a film cassette. Synthesis and labeling of nucleic acids. There is no need for labeling DNA if large quantities of DNA are available because the DNA bands can be visualized by conventional ethidium bromide staining. However, it is usually preferable that when low concentrations of DNA are used, they should be labeled before performing the experiment as it will facilitate detection and will also add sensitivity to the method. Following are some of the labeling methods. First is the DNA that can be labeled with a radioactive 32P by incorporating a DNTP during the 3' prime fill-in reaction using the Klinov fragment. Second, 5' prime end labeling using a 32P ATP using a T4 polynucleotide kinase. And lastly, non-radioactive methods are also available to label and detect nucleic acid probes such as biotin, digoxygenin and fluoropores. Now, what is the binding reaction that is involved in electrophoretic mobility shift acid? First of all, we need to mix the following components except the labeled protein in a vial. This would include the protein sample, the binding buffer, the poly D and is added to the binding reaction as a competitor for non-specific DNA binding protein. We need to incubate this particular mixture for 20 minutes at 4 degrees centigrade. The labeled DNA probe is then added and incubated at room temperature for additional 20 minutes. Don non-denaturing gel electrophoresis. After the binding reaction, the next step is to separate the free nucleic acid from the complexes formed by a non-denaturing gel electrophoresis. Polyacrylamide or agarose gels can be used for EMSA based on the size of the nucleic acid or the complex and the desired resolution. The steps for this particular electrophoresis are the same as described in agarose gel electrophoresis and SDS page electrophoresis. They include gel casting, sample loading and the electrophoresis. The resolution of the complexes depends on the stability during the electrophoresis. The routinely used buffers are variants of tris borate EDTA, tris acetate EDTA or tris glycine. Binding of the reaction buffer can also be used as electrophoresis buffer in some conditions. This has the advantage of having no need to independently optimize binding and electrophoresis buffer conditions. Both polyacrylamide and agarose can be used for EMSA, but polyacrylamide gels offer better electrophoretic resolution for protein DNA and protein RNA complexes. It may be noted that irrespective of the type of electrophoresis that is used, it will be under native conditions. 
after having run the electrophoresis it becomes important to detect the shift or the run of these molecules and complexes by staining with molecules that bind to nucleic acid we can see or visualize the movement of the DNA and the DNA complexes. If the nucleic acid has previously not been labeled, we could use a conventional ethidium bromide or chromophores or fluoropores such as red safe DNA stain or cyber safe DNA gel stain. The use of ethidium bromide and these chromophores would be applicable in experiments where you have a large quantity of DNA in the experiment. If there is a less quantity of DNA, then it should be labeled for detection based on the nature of the label such as the radioactive isotope such as 32 phosphorus. It is one of the easiest and most sensitive methods to detect nucleic acid but it has to be borne in mind that it's a hazardous material to work with. There are other common labels such as biotin, digoxygenin and fluoropores. These are innocuous but usually give less sensitive results and the detection procedure can involve extra steps such as transfer to the membrane, incubation with primary and secondary antibodies as well as intermediate washing steps. Now, to summarize the advantages of the technique that is the EMSA. EMSA is a very simple experiment to perform and a sturdy technique that can adapt to wide range of conditions. Radioisotope labeling of nucleic acid and autoradiography make it a very sensitive method. A variety of non-radioactive labels that can be detected by fluorescence and chemiluminescence make EMSA very versatile. A wide range of nucleic acid sizes and structures as well as a wide range of proteins from small nucleotides to heavy transcription complexes are compatible with this particular platform of experiment. EMSA can be used both for crude protein extracts as well as purified recombinant proteins. Now, what are the limitations or disadvantages of this particular technique? Rapid dissociation of complexes occur during electrophoresis and can interfere with the detection of the complexes. There are many factors other than the size of the protein which decide the electrophoretic movement of the protein nucleic acid complex. Therefore, resulting in mobility shift that does not give a direct measure of the characteristics of the proteins that are present in the complex. Electrophoretic mobility of the complex provides little direct information about the location of the nucleic acid sequences that are occupied by the protein. Some of the applications of EMSA also include determining the dissociation constant. KD or the dissociation constant is the equilibrium constant that measures the tendency of a complex to dissociate into its two components. Dissociation constant is calculated as a concentration when 50% of the receptor is occupied for a ligand interaction. Here, in our experiment, the receptor is the DNA and the ligand is the protein. Hence, dissociation constant is got when 50% of DNA is bound by protein. The methodology includes using a fixed concentration of DNA that is titrated with excess of protein. The bound and free DNA are then separated using this technique of EMSA. The measured density bands. KD will equal the protein concentration when 50% of DNA is free. In our understanding of dissociation constant, we see an experiment where a fixed amount of DNA of 500 base pair is 
titrated against different concentration of protein ranging from 0 to 1.5 micromolar. When protein is present at only 0 0.25 micromolar, it does not interfere with the DNA mobility as seen in well number 2 as the band covered the same distance as the first sample in which the protein was not present which is well number 1. When 1.5 micromolar of the small delta antigen that was used as protein is present in the binding reaction, there is almost no free DNA present and the majority of the molecules are bound in the complex which is well number 5. In the intermediate concentrations, it can be clearly seen or observed that the decreasing presence of free DNA and increasing DNA protein complexes as the protein concentration rises which is well seen on well number 3. This is established by the fact that the intensity of the bands in the free form and the bound form are almost the same indicating an association of up to 50 percent. Application of EMSA also includes proving the presence of transcription factor. This particular assay is used to determine if a particular transcription factor is present within the nuclei of cells or tissue of interest. In this particular experiment, electrophoresis is carried out using two wells where well number one has the nuclear extract of non-activated cells and well 2 has nuclear extract of activated cells. It is clearly seen in the experiment that there is a dark black band in the lower part of well 1. This is the radioactively labeled oligonucleotide with the NF kappa B binding site but without the presence of the protein. Whereas in well number 2 we see a dark band even in the upper part which shows that there is a radioactively labeled oligonucleotide with NF kappa B binding site and the site also containing the NF kappa B. This clearly demonstrates the presence of NF kappa B in the nuclear extract. Having understood EMSA, we now try to understand the alternatives and variants of EMSA. The first is the super shift assay. In super shift assay, we compare the mobility of the free DNA, second the DNA with the protein complex and finally a protein DNA complex with the particular antibody. So in this particular experiment, the formation of the antibody protein DNA complex further hinders the movement of the complex within the gel. So, if the mobility of the protein and DNA complex is termed as a shift assay, the further reduced mobility of the complex with the antibody is therefore aptly called as the super shift. To explain further using an analogy, I would consider a family that is trying to reach a particular platform on the railway station. And as you people know, railway stations are usually crowded. This is akin to our, the matrix of within the acrylamide gel. A family consisting of children would now try to move across this particular crowd to reach their particular platform. The children having no burden of the luggage freely crisscross through the crowd and move fast. In comparison, the parents who are slightly taller and bigger and have certain amount of bags on them find it slightly more difficult to move across from one end of the station to the other platform. And thirdly, we have the coolie. The coolie who is having 
bags and luggages on his hand, on his head, finds it most difficult to move across from one end of the station to the platform. In much the similar way, the DNA could be compared to the children. The DNA with the complex of the protein could be compared to parents with limited number of luggages. And finally, the antibody protein DNA complex could be compared to the coolie who is having baggages or luggage on his hand and on his head. A few other alternatives and variants of EMSA include chromatin immunoprecipitation and DNA footprinting. In chromatin immunoprecipitation, we have capturing of the protein DNA interaction on a cross-linking agent, example a formaldehyde. Antibodies are used to specifically immunoprecipitate a desired protein of interest and quantitate PCR is used to measure the quantity of DNA that is bound to this particular protein. In DNA footprinting, we use a method where identification of the binding site is recognized by specific protein. It is based on the fact that interaction of a protein to a unique DNA sequence shields that particular region of the DNA from further modifications by enzymes like DNAs or few other chemicals. So students, let us now summarize what we have learned in this particular module. EMSA is the most widely used method for detection of protein DNA interactions. The works on the observation that protein-bound DNA migrate that much more slowly as compared to free DNA when subjected to electrophoresis through, through non-denaturing gel. It is used for various purposes such as quantifying the interactions between proteins and DNA, determining the binding affinities, but most importantly is the characterization of transcription factors. There are several alternatives or variants to EMSA which include footprinting, super shift and the chip. Thank you.